other panelists will join us shortly. And just so everyone knows, I am recording. Um, this will be posted by 24 hours in uh, the R3 community in case you want to go back and watch or you know someone who missed it who might want to engage. All right, Scott, good to go. Okay, well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Scott Lavin. I'm the Wildlife Recreation Branch Chief for the Arizona Game and Fish Department. And I'm also on uh, the national implementation uh, team's uh, statewide collaboration team, which is the product uh, that we're going to be talking about today. I'm going to share a screen real quick and just kind of give you a little bit of history on how we got to where we are today. that come up okay I can't see you guys when I'm presenting so um, so as, as you know uh, you all know about the council's uh, uh, national implementation work group um, just a couple uh, let's see this far. there we go so here's a picture of the team um, really incredible group of people a great cross-section of uh, NGO uh, state wildlife professionals and industry uh, leaders who obviously are vested in R3, right? Um, we met several times in person and virtually. And uh, as you can see, we had a, a very colorful uh, process in identifying what, what are the, the challenges that we, we, we wanted to tackle. Uh, this has been a two year process. Um, it, it's been handled and facilitated flawlessly by council staff. Um, and uh, as you can see, we, we, we had to narrow down on, on a few topics, right? So uh, after going through an exhaustive process of making sure we were, one, hitting on the right topics and hitting on topics that we could actually impact, right? So um, the, the five uh, main uh, work groups that are currently moving forward and, and providing uh, uh, products as a result of this journey are statewide collaborations, which we're going to talk about today, marketing, mentoring, data and organizational culture, and clearinghouse. So um, these were the products that, that we felt that we, we had a lot of expertise to, to detail and that we could make movement forwards. And you, you've probably seen uh, other sub work groups uh, progress as well. So as far as statewide collaborations, uh, it, it was a, a, a pretty sizable group group. Uh, we've got four of the panelists today that had case studies that were part of the project, um, but it was a pretty broad group. And we reached out to our networks and we engaged uh, not just with our team members, but with other R3 professionals, NGO leaders, mentors, hunters, volunteers, uh, to really dial in what, what is working, what is not working, and what was really needed to achieve this scale. The reason why we collaborate is because we don't have the scale and the resources to do it ourselves, right? So, so the product that's going to be posted on the data clearinghouse, the product that goes with this presentation, we're not going to go through the whole product today. We just don't have time. Uh, it's not a, a lengthy product. It's a pretty easy read, but we, we, we talk about the strategy of collaborations, how hard they are to get started. How do you engage partners, first time partners, ones that uh, are non-traditional? Um, how do you host the conference? How do you get people to the table? What do you talk about? And, and how do you, you, you identify calls to action from that meeting? Um, how do you brand such a collaboration? Who's, is there a host? Uh, uh, what, what is the, the, the customer experience? What, what do the, the new to hunting community uh, see this collaboration as and how, they, how do they interact with it? And it's something that's become increasingly important in R3 uh, in, in our regional and national association meetings is, is surveying data, right? What, 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 what did the person take away from that experience? Was it a positive experience? As a result of that experience, are they likely to go and pursue hunting? So this, this is just kind of high level. Um, this resource uh, will be posted on the, the, the uh, data clearinghouse here shortly. Um, and then the, 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 the product culminates in uh, four case studies of states that had um, were able to, to compile some uh, data and some information on uh, what is going on in their state and, and just in uh, alphabetic order in Arizona today we're going to be speaking with Ryan Connett. He's the statewide R3 coordinator for Arizona and he's with the National Wild Turkey Federation. We're going to be speaking in California with uh, Jennifer Benedet. 
uh, who is the statewide R3 coordinator, and she's with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. Uh, in Georgia, you just heard uh, Charles Evans has, has changed hats. Uh, now he's the manager of partnerships for the Appointments Process. Uh, he was the R3 manager for the Georgia Wildlife Federation. And then finally, uh, in Iowa, we have Megan Wisecup, uh, the uh, Hunter Education Administrator for the Iowa Department of Natural Resources. I'm going to quit sharing here. And we're going to go to the panel now. Um, got a couple questions to kind of get the conversation started. Um, and then what we'd like to do uh, is hopefully, and soon enough that we can have some time for people attending the call to ask questions. Uh, and I'm sure uh, the council will be providing some follow-up uh, post events. So first to navigate, we'll just go alphabetical order. So I'll start it with you, Ryan, in Arizona. Um, you know, all the co uh, collaborations that we looked at, these four, um, you've achieved some really impressive successes. How do you keep the partner organizations engaged and going in the same direction? What, 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 how do you keep people focused and headed for the, for the same point on the map? Yeah, so um, a little bit of history lesson in regards to, to Arizona. Um, Arizona was certainly one of the one of the early adopters in regards to looking looking towards statewide R three collaborations. Um, in two thousand five, the agency was working on a, a hunting and shooting sports recruitment and uh, retention team plan, um, which kind of got the buzz going in Arizona about starting some sort of hunter recruitment effort. Um, the uh, the partners came in and said, agents, the agency, if you're going to do this by yourself, you're going to screw this up. You need us to come in help you out um, and, and run this thing effectively. So that's really what got the ball rolling or early 10, 15 years ago. Um, and it's been a process building ever since. And I think we'll talk about some of them a little bit later. Um, but in regards to what we do throughout the calendar year, that really keeps uh, the collaboration heading in the same direction. We have um, biannual statewide R3 workshops, um, which is uh, winter and summer. Um, and that's paired with biannual outdoor recreation business summits, which is spring and fall. Um, now they don't serve the exact same um, set of partners or constituents, but there's a lot of overlap. And I think they actually pair together really nicely because we're able to share successes across the agency, NGO, industry, and media partners um, that have really reinforced this statewide collaboration. Um, we have a steering committee that is currently meeting monthly. It was about four to six times a year. Um, and due to the, the uncertainty of this year, we've ramped it up to every month. So that's been really helpful in, in staying up to date on a lot of the changes that we're all facing. Um, a note about our steering committee is that, although it's about it's represented, represented with about 12 different um, key stakeholders, leaders in conservation in Arizona throughout many different clubs or, or conservation organizations, um, they're part of the steering committee based on a skill set, not necessarily what hat they wear, who they came in with. So um, we really try to keep that diverse and focused on have somebody with marketing, have somebody with shooting sports, fishing, and all those different things to give us a really complete idea of the things that are going on in the state of Arizona. Um, and a couple other things that we, especially this year, we've ramped up our R3 newsletters, which go to our stakeholders or our practitioners to keep them updated on um, things going on within the R3 community, things going on within Arizona, opportunities, changes, R3 science, those kind of things. Social media engagement. Um, we run two pages that are outside of the Arizona Game and Fish page. So we have our Outdoor Skills Network page, which is really our customer storefront page for participants, covers events and things like that. And then we have our Hunting and Angling Heritage Work Group page, which is really our business to business communication page. So both of those have, have seen quite a bit of growth this year. Um, and are you know still really strong ways for us to communicate. Um, and then we have best practices that that uh, keep everybody kind of on the same set of standards, same set of expectations. And again, I think we're going to get into that a little bit more um, later in the discussion. So um, those are just kind of the high level things that we do do throughout the year that that keep everybody headed in the same direction and kind of on the same page. Uh, that, that's some good technique there. A lot of uh, uh, layered approach, pretty solid. Um, Jennifer, you know, California is easily the biggest state uh, the, uh, that's part of the, uh, the, the, the processes that we looked at. It was no surprise. Your collaboration numbers are just crazy. How do you try, how do you try and keep them all headed 
uh, in the right direction or working together with that many partners? Uh, yeah, thanks, Scott. I, I think uh, it's challenging and I and it's messy. You know, I'll just be transparent and say that um, anybody who says this process isn't messy, isn't messy, isn't telling the truth. So, um, you know, there's that. And I think being okay with the mess and, and the sort of like disorganized chaos, um, something beautiful happens. And that is everybody realizes that they're learning together. Um, and so, I think that the main three things that California has really tried to do is make it easy for them, show them how, and offer collaboration opportunities. Those are like the big three. And within that, um, make it easy for them. So meet them where they're at. Don't expect them to come to us, but, but try to meet them where they're at. And that's really the same thing that we're trying to do with the hunting and fishing community, right, in R3. We're trying to meet new folks where they are, not asking them to meet us where we are. So, you know, by that I mean we try to participate in their meetings, um, especially if there are collaborative meetings happening in the state. Um, I'm always available and our three teams are always available by phone. Uh, we try to participate in their efforts if we're invited, uh, but we also don't push our way into their efforts, right, because we're all autonomous entities and we're also not speaking as the experts. Um, so, you know, I often will participate in publications or reviewing materials for events uh, to make sure that things are sort of jiving together statewide. Um, and so anytime we're invited to participate in their efforts, we try to take advantage of that, but then we also try to invite them into our efforts um, by showing them what we're doing and leading by example. So that's the sh show them how. Um, when I say show them how, I don't mean act as the expert, right? Um, but we regularly try to report what we're doing as an agency and what our successes are. Um, and that includes reporting what maybe didn't work so well and being okay with shifting gears and being transparent about why those things maybe didn't work. Um, and making sure that we're not just talking the talk, but we're walking the walk, right? Um, when we show them how, we want to make sure that we are showing diversity and inclusion. We are showing the effort to make changes across multiple things at the same time. Um, and then the third thing, offer collaborative opportunities. Um, you know, the R3 team in California is always trying to think of mutually beneficial outcomes in the things that we do. Not something that's just beneficial to the department, but also something that is mutually beneficial across the different types of organizations and external partner um, entities. So whether that's media or volunteers or education um, or hunting and fishing conservation organizations or other governments and tribal governments, um, we're trying to think of things that could be mutually beneficial so that way everyone has an equal stake in the process. I, I can't thank you enough for the candor there and the honesty. We, you know, it, it, this is, you know, you have to be able to manage with uncertainty sometimes. And uh, being able to admit that and, and, and embrace your mistakes and move on quickly is, is really great. That's awesome. Um, Charles, you know, not only did you have an R3 community in Georgia, but your position was supported by a community, your former position. I think you won the award for having the most bosses at one time. Uh, multiple organizations that probably added a, another layer of complexity. Um, but it, I'm wondering, did it improve your ability of keeping people on on course because maybe there was more frequent uh, communications reporting to those bosses? Yeah, absolutely. So I think we'll get into some of the challenges that might have been associated with that a little bit later in this discussion. But for those that aren't familiar, the the Georgia R three position that I was in, it started almost five years ago and it was a cooperative position, still is a cooperative position, with five funding partners uh, with a steering committee that oversaw the position and the initiative in the state as a whole. So those weren't the only partners involved in R3 in Georgia, obviously, but they were the ones funding that position that the intent of the position was to kind of serve as the strategic conduit, if you will, uh, the glue that holds everything together and pushes things forward in the state. So. It, starting on you know the basis of trying to keep partner organizations involved, having that cooperative position and the literal buy-in was a big piece of it. Um, moving forward from there, you know you, you hear a lot of you've heard both Jen and Ryan mention statewide meetings. I think we're going to see that as a consistent theme 
keeping everybody engaged at the state level, having um, at least an annual meeting where you're pulling all of those partners together with a vested interest in you know, hunting, shooting, sports, fishing, whatever your R3 goals are in your state, uh, together to discuss the topics is a big thing. And so we did annual uh, Georgia R3 summits. And as part of those, we usually had something we were working on every year uh, outside of just the networking between organizations. And so the first year that we dove into it, we were working on our strategic plan. So we used that plan uh, as the first piece to pull together partners. We developed it in, in a consensus approach. Instead of just writing a plan and having it being a prescriptive plan, we brought all the partners together and decided on the strategies and actions together that we were gonna move forward with in the state. And branching out of that, we uh, formed committees that were focused on a lot of the bigger ticket action items in that plan. So the whole, all of the steps that we took to uh, try to develop the strategy and implement the strategy, we try to involve partners along the way. And then since then, there's been committee engagement with some of the pilot programming and events that we've done. We always try to involve partners and uh, help them push forward throughout. So I think that's, in a nutshell, uh, the main things that we focus on to try to keep partners engaged as we move forward. Nice, great work. Uh, you know, Megan, I had the good fortune of attending one of your constituent meetings. You, you put together a, a, a great agenda and, and you have a, a wonderful venue uh, that, that supported some really great communication. Uh, obviously, that's one of the things you're doing, but what, what else are you doing to, to try and keep everybody moving forward on, on the goal that uh, you're, you know, you're setting for yourselves? Whoever knew going in alphabetical order in I state would be last. <laughs> I didn't graduate college. <laughs> no, um, definitely could echo a lot of the stuff that's already been said, but just to add some um, additional things is uh, one of the things that we did as we got started in building our collaborative approach to this is really take the time um, like to, to meet our, our partners, both external and internal, um, where they're at. So we, we spent a, a good solid year, year and a half going out to their meetings, going out to meet with the bureaus at their statewides, um, presenting to our Natural Resource Commission to really kind of lay that foundational framework of some, um, some basic concepts behind R3, you know, getting the prog problem and the real issues out there. So we were all on a level playing field so that we were, were coming together to start our collaboration um, with some, some common ground. So. Um, that took some time and, and definitely some feeding and nurturing, but it was truly beneficial. Um, as we began to, to put our um, plan together, um, very much like Charles, we, we dove in and, and didn't do just the internal first. We, we did both internal, external, kind of simultaneously getting them engaged. So. Uh, we created some some work groups and some committees and planning as we began to to develop our plan. Um, one of the thing approach that we took is we brought in a facilitator. We were fortunate enough to have one within our our agency um, that's super knowledgeable not about not only about our agency, but also about a lot of our, our partners as well. So um, she did some facilitation for us and that allowed myself and um, my team, since we don't have a dedicated R3 person in Iowa, it's, it's been kind of a, another duty as assigned to uh, my back as the lead and then a, a couple of our other staff members as well within the agency. So really taking a, a team-based approach, but it allowed us to sit back and listen because it, it was hard because you know I'm the hunter ed administrator. So I have my parts that I want to interject in there so if I was trying to facilitate it too it made it really hard for me to not feel like I was driving or trying to steer the uh, the conversation in a certain way so being able to to have a separate facilitator that we kind of worked in the background but be the one that le led some of those conversations that allowed us to listen which is extremely important and then also be able to interject where needed to represent the, the individual programs that we also manage in our other roles so um, that was uh, one thing that was very key um, to getting us started and to continue that communication um, which is really the topic of, of this question is we've continued to have an, an annual summit each year um, we did developed work group committees, kind of like um, Charles has done down in Georgia and, and some of the other states have done as well on those, those key areas. So we have an access committee, we have an, an education and outreach committee, we have a marketing committee, um, we have a research committee. So we've kind of developed those, those um, where folks that have interest in those areas can get together and kind of really help drive some of those strategic objectives. And then we um, also developed a task force. We, we realized really quickly getting together once a year wasn't enough to keep 
the momentum going. Um, and, and to be blunt, um, like Jen, that's, that's kind of the biggest failure and the, and the hardest thing of not being a full-time coordinator. And even when you are the full-time coordinator, I still think it's a struggle is you get that momentum, you get everybody together, everyone's jazzed up, ready to go. And then you get back all to your, to your regular jobs, your regular lives. And it's really, quick and easy to lose that momentum. So um, really trying to find ways by having some of um, the, the partners that can invest time uh, more than once a year to, to continue that conversation ongoing so that we can continue to, to drive each other, motivate each other to, to keep things moving um, has been key to, to getting stuff done and off the ground. Um, and also, like Jen said, providing some services to make it easier on our partners. That's one of the ways we've tried to do to keep our, our partners engaged. So um, inviting them to be able to post their events in our event management system, helping to do pre-post and follow-up surveys for them, helping them to build case studies. So, so putting some of our manpower and expertise behind some of their efforts um, to, to help them out um, has been a, a huge lift to, to keeping that, that conversation going and, and keeping them um, motivated to, to try new things. And, and if we find something work to try to start making it more scalable and, and getting it out there across the state. Nice, nice. I'm, I'm, I'm starting to catch some themes already here. Uh, it, it takes active leadership. Uh, I'm hearing um, you guys have to be willing to support your partners as much as the, the efforts you're asking from them. Um, so it's not a one-way street. It's not all about you, right? Um, and then building a shared vision through the use of committees and, and uh, in-person events. Um, and and I, I heard several of you say that you have to put in the miles. You have have to make that invitation in person. You just can't send out an email or, or a social media post, right? So um, a lot of work coordinating that and, and, and managing that traffic. Um, I want to move on. Um, you, you know, you're all taking very different approaches. And, and there really was, at least, you know, since I've been around, there was no roadmap on how do you do this, right? So um, in the R3 community recently, we've seen the increased emphasis on measuring program results, right? What are the metrics um, that you've developed to track the effectiveness of your collaboration? How are you navigating that, that you know when you go to bed at night, you're headed in the right direction? And I want to start shaking it up a little bit. Jennifer, if I could approach you on that one first. Uh, sure. So the way that California measures metrics, I, I don't know, maybe is a little bit different than uh, the ability of some other states. Um, because we can't and don't capture information uh, like registration and things from our external partners, um, and, you know, that provides some challenges to determining what, what's successful and how, how do we measure success and what do those metrics look like. Um, so something that we've done inside the department, though, is um, our automated license data folks and license and revenue branch folks are data wizards. Um, and so they've been able to create something called Power BI da a dashboard. Um, and you, I encourage everyone to look up what Power BI is if you're not familiar with it. Um, but basically it feeds off of our automatic license, our automated license data information in real time and gives us our three R's um, in measurable statistics. So in live, I mean, at, at the drop of any second that you wanna know them. Um, so if an event happens, let's say a giant clinic happens somewhere, I could log on to the Power BI dashboard and measure license purchases over the next 24 hours or over the next year if I wanted to, targeting the zip code or location um, that, that those events are occurring to see. Now, is that a direct correlation of those events? That's, that's where it's sort of unknown, right? Because we, we don't know. Uh, we can make assumptions, but as, as far as hard data goes, we don't actually know because we don't ask the questions. Um, but that dashboard can be used in all sorts of ways, and it, it, it's not difficult to create. Um, so anyway, I, I encourage everyone to look up Power BI. The other things that we do is we have um, R3 program integration into our, automat our automated license data system. So anytime R3 runs a program from inside the department and we capture registration information, we can run those registrations against our licensing data to find out, um, did it result in a license purchase? Did it, are, is it drawing people who have recently purchased a license for the first time? Is it drawing people who are reactivated um, purchasers? Uh, is it resulting in no license purchase? And then we can, 
determine whether or not we need to send a survey out to find out why. Like, why aren't you buying a license? Um, you know, so those integrations also exist in California. Um, the other things that we're doing more specifically with our partners is we're creating surveys and administering surveys to check in with them about their capacity to do R3 work. Um, for example, we just recently conducted one to find out where partners are in their ability to participate in R3 efforts with the considerations of 2020, um, knowing that external partners have been hit with um, budget issues because of the pandemic and the inability to do fundraising activities, for example, or in-person uh, clinics and deliverables. And, you know, we're concerned with that because in California, our partners are really, they really provide the social support for the retention activities. So without them, we fail as an R3 effort. And so we really want to know that what the temperature is about their ability to be able to do these things. Um, and so surveys have been really a great tool to find out that in California, one third of organizations have ceased R3 efforts individually because of 2020 considerations. One third has seen no change and one third has actually been able to dedicate more time to R3 efforts because they aren't feeling the constraints of other things because their volunteers are working from home now. So they, they actually have more free time to, to dedicate. So uh, all of those things together have really helped us to develop and track the effectiveness of various R3 efforts, including collaboration. I love that you tie it, you're able to track it and tie it to a license sales, because really that's the ultimate goal, right? So many R3 programs um, waive the license for that first time experience to, to entice people and lower the barrier, which is absolutely a proving tactic, right? But ultimately we still need to track them to that license sales. That, those are some pretty neat, neat tools definitely going to be Googling Power BI because we don't have anything like that where I am. Um, Charles, uh, how are you navigating uh, your R3 effort and, and, and tracking your effectiveness? Well, we have, uh, so a, a little bit different than Jen's, but the same idea is we have a dashboard that was developed by Southwick when he was uh, doing a lot of the initial dash, dashboard stuff. And so we're able to look at license trends over time in the different demographic groups and you can use that to do targeted marketing to reduce churn which has been shown through some studies with the marketing department at georgia dnr um, and other states as well so that's been very effective as far as the tracking events and license purchases based off of those events uh, we're we're lucky to be using brant for our licensing and event registration system and so it's all integrated. So we're, we're piloting it right now and we're in the development stages of really building it out to where we have this system that anybody signs up for an event in there, they've automatically created a, a customer ID on that website and we can track their future and past license purchasing behavior. So for example, Field to Fork was a big program that we focused on in Georgia. Um, I would make sure that all the Field to Fork participants registered through the Georgia DNR site even though it wasn't you know an officially a georgia dnr program that we're a partner and then i can look at what percentage of these participants had already purchased licenses in previous years and five years down the road we can check in and see how many purchase licenses down the road so that's kind of the the system that we're trying to build out it it works we've been using it for pilot programs and state-run programs the dream is to uh, build it out with evaluation integrated, which we're doing right now, or we were doing when I left with Brant and are still working on. So there's going to be a, a pre-event survey built into it with an automatic post-event survey. Uh, anybody, regardless of organizational affiliation that's running an R3 program in the state will be encouraged and possibly incentivized to use that registration system. And uh, it, it'll be much like, you know, we talked to, to you, Scott, and Ryan, and Doug with y'all's awesome registration system that you have going on out there that I'm sure Ryan's going to talk about. And that was kind of the idea behind it with tracking built in. So that's a, another way that we, we focus on the metrics of it and try to actually track the progress from an event standpoint. With the overall R3 initiative, um, a lot of the metrics that we were putting out, you know, it, it can be very difficult to track in real time, like what Jen was saying, and, uh, you know, cause and effect versus correlation. And so one thing that the George DNR really wanted to see was they wanted to see the the value of the initiative quantified. And so we're able to do that through the volunteer hours that people put into it and the match that's eligible for that. 
um, as well as license purchases that we can directly attribute to it, and then in-kind dollars that come into the state through grants, um, partner time, things like that. And that quantification has really helped us move forward and, and put it in a monetary perspective, which the CFOs love to see, right? You know, you mentioned the volunteer hours and match, and with, with uh, the PR bubble that we've experienced over the last several years, a lot of state agencies have struggled with being able to compile enough volunteer hours to make full use of those funds. So that's great that you're working on that. Um, and that sounds like a great resource to combine your licensing system with your event system. Um, a lot of you talked about sharing and, and, and providing services that, you know, for your constituents. Uh, I think it's great that one of the partners in the collaboration is providing a service for the other partners, even though it might not be their events. I think that's true collaboration. That's pretty awesome. Um, Megan, how, how are you guys doing it in Iowa? What, what are your, some of your navigational aids to measure your success? I think you're still muted, Megan. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, definitely um, some of the, the tactics um, have already been mentioned on the call, such as um, we have a dashboard as well um, that we've worked with Southwick on. Um, I mentioned earlier in my previous response how we um, are allowing partners to use our event management system. Um, we currently use Calcomy system um, for that, and we've been able to build in that, that pre-survey. So that's um, being able to automate things is, is really key um, to doing it. And I think I mentioned on one of our pre calls, it's it, when you're working with partners on this, it's really tricking folks into evaluation. People don't like to, they hear the word evaluation. It's like, uh, I don't want to deal with that. I don't want the time of it. I mean, we don't have the time to really go through if, and collect handwritten surveys and analyze it and do do justice to be able to get things through. So being able to, to have tools now available to us to automate those um, pieces has been key. And if we can provide a service to a partner by allowing them to, to put their event in our system and we can help market that and get them new users or new uh, uh, potential constituents to their organization and and um, help them expand their reach then you know we have that information in there then we can do some of those metrics and analysis and and really see how um, their customer journey and and how they came to the event and and, and what they do after the event so um, by kind of like scratching their back it scratches our back we get we both get the information and and we're both happy and um, and that works out and the biggest thing that's been able to help us expand getting more partners to do that is letting um, the, their success um, sell itself so we were invited to multiple state meetings to talk about event management um, and we, we were met with pretty you know limited interest or resistance once we got a few of our, our key chapters to buy in and they seen the benefits of it the next time when they invited us back to, to talk about it at their at their state meeting or whatnot we had them present um, then we had multiple chapters wanting to get engaged and use it when they could hear their peers talk about the benefits that they seen for their um, organization then it became real and and they it was doable and it wasn't the DNR coming in and saying that hey you should really do this they they could see the the benefit um, from listening to another organization so again it's all about kind of you know kind of meeting folks where there are um, letting them uh, sell their own successes and one of the other key things is um, that we're fortunate we have grant for our licensing system um, so we've been able to build those APIs between our event management and to our licensing system to do some of that um, tracking that Charles mentioned and then also for any of our, our marketing or outreach initiatives going forward we're able to put some some tracking um, in so that we can get them from click to purchase so we can really see you know what ads are resulting in, uh, in, in a direct purchase and being able to tie them back to that um, licensed buyer so that's been huge this past year since we've gotten that ability um, to be able to, to see those types of metrics in regards to some of our, our outreach and, and marketing efforts um, which is definitely how you can become scalable and, and reach the masses versus just through programming you know the technology that's in the field now compared to just a decade ago is the data that we have access to is just crazy it's like all of a sudden we're flying 747s when we started an old Dodge pickup um, you, you know, you, you spoke of um, the, the shared resources again um, and evolving the partners. You know, you've got, you know, dozens of partners. They're not all at the same level, right? Not all, the, all of them are well funded. Not all of them are well staffed. And their level of sophistication varies. And, and bringing them along and making them comfortable with these new techniques, that's, that's a lot of uh, negotiation there. Good job on you there. 
Um, Ryan, can you close us out on this question on what you're doing in Arizona to uh, track the effectiveness of your collaboration? Yeah, so a lot of things that have been mentioned mentioned here um, on this topic already, but just to highlight a few. Um, so in Arizona, we don't have a licensed dashboard system currently. I know it's something, uh, one of our pain points, something we're working on. Um, but we've used that as kind of an opportunity to really try to sophisticate our event management system. Um, you know, and to highlight a couple of the things that, that Megan said, um, it does take time. It, it, it took time to implement um, an event management system where, you know, the vast majority of our partners are using that for their events, um, which again, we, you know, we use the pre-event survey and registration data as well to, to help kind of um, propel our R3 uh, program forward, but also making it mutually beneficial. Um, again, like Megan said, which I think was, is really important in regards to things, especially like evaluation, because there has to be some sort of service to, to the partners, right? Um, and it's essentially saying, hey, we're gonna run your event management for you. Um, we'll get you a report before your event starts of who's coming to your event, their skill level, all these different pre-event questions that we ask them. Um, and I know our partners really appreciate that in regards to running their events and, and making them the most efficient possible, especially when you're running with limited mentors or things like that, kind of understanding the scale and scope of who you have coming to your events from event management standpoint. Um, something that, that Arizona implemented with, with our event management system, which I think has been really helpful, is incorporating different skill levels um, or different kind of event skill so people can self-identify with where they at in regards to their journey to learning how to hunt, fish, shoot, whatever, whatever they're working on. Um, and, I, and I believe our scale goes from introductory to experienced. Um, and again, that's, that's more, really more of a self-identification tool, but it's helped us progress our participants and kind of our customer base through the adoption sequence, um, which has been really important to us. Another, another cool kind of spin we put on our event management system was um, we've created a mentor registration module, uh, which we've paired with our event registration module. So essentially, if our partner is running an event, we, we provide the, the opportunity for them to register their participants in one spot and their mentors in another spot, which really lets us get a deep dive into who's coming, who's helping out their skill levels, um, how we can best match them. And then um, from our end as the agency, we're able to use those two um, pools of data differently. So we follow up with the participants. We make sure they have next steps where they can share their successes, keep them going down the adoption sequence. And then we're able to look at the mentors and say, you know, hey, did you know that uh, here's some other opportunities for you to get involved? Here's another deer camp. You know, you, you say that you're an experienced deer hunter. Here's an opportunity for you to get involved. And it's really kind of um, propelled our, our mentor efforts forward. You know, it, it, we are in kind of the infancy stage of that. But I see some real potential with that. Um, and just kind of a few other things that, that we've done in Arizona, um, a few um, offshoot studies. In 2018, we did two DJ case um, and associate studies. One, really evaluating our participant data in that pre-event survey data. And then we also did a separate survey of our event hosts or really kind of our, our partners, our constituents to see how they feel about the R3 program, different pieces in regarding um, services that the agency is providing where they could see us improve what they want us to focus on um, how to you know make it make it easier for them as event hosts um, to really kind of keep them as effective as possible um, in 2015 there was a, a focus group study of event participants and that's actually the study that helped derive that um, skill level uh, event classification for skill level for for our events um, so that was a really solid outcome from that as well as uh, 2009 um, responsive management study on mentors, um, which I've read that thing a hundred times, and it's really cool to see some of the the new data coming from uh, Dunphy and Southwick in regards to their mentor study, um, kind of reaffirming some of the things that that um, uh, Duda found early in in 2009. So um, it's cool to see that that you know evaluation is one of the key products in in regards to the implementation work group because I think we all understand the importance of that, and then see things like the multi-state grant really focusing on regional scale efforts of, of evaluation. So um, it's something I know we're all, we're all working really hard to improve on um, and it's gonna be important moving forward. You know, just about all of you have a destination for the public to go to, right? 
and and <clears throat> when they get to they get to see the buffet of what's out there uh, and giving them a choice. Um, and then the, the fact that you all are trying to engage and get some type of survey feedback back, make sure that your participants are happy and having a good experience. I think that's sound. Um, so we're running out of time a little bit here, so I'm gonna ramp it up a little bit. We're gonna go into a little bit of a lightning round. I've got two questions uh, we're gonna ask. Uh, pretty specific, usually it should be a single topic answer. Um, and then hopefully that'll leave us with some time for uh, some other questions from the party. Uh, so uh, Charles, if you, you, can, you get to be the first in the lightning round here. Um, what has been the greatest, the number one challenge in building your collaboration? What's the toughest hurdle? I'm going to break the rules and, and do two really quick. Um, no. <laughs> the first one is, is something that you hit on earlier, Scott, is the newness of R3, right? Um, and especially five years ago, and I know Scott, you and, and Megan and a few other people have been working on this for a long time. But to me, it was really new. To Georgia, it was relatively new. And um, with deer management, we've got it figured out, right? We have best management practices that are pretty universally agreed upon. We can tell you how to do it. With R3, we're still figuring out what those best management practices are. So building a collaboration uh, without necessarily really firm best management practices can be a little bit of a challenge. And messy, like Jen said, which I, I love that she brought that up. The other thing that can be very messy is working for five organizations at one time. And that, that's where, you know, it's, it was one of the greatest challenges in Georgia, you know, because it was Georgia DNR, Georgia Wildlife Federation, National Wild Turkey Federation, Quality Deer Management Association, and the Georgia chapter of Safari Club International that were all funding the position, and they still are all funding the position. So some of the drawbacks to that are you spend a lot of time kind of figuring out exactly what the group wants and trying to move forward and appease every organization. But, so, so that's a huge challenge, but that comes with a lot of benefits as well that you can wear all of those different hats at one time you can tap into all those different resources and have a broader level of influence so i didn't want to leave it that it's just a challenge it's also a, a benefit since you're the only one who has five bosses we'll let you get away with that cheat um, <laughs> yeah, uh, megan what, what, what's been your, your greatest challenge if somebody else is out uh, watching this and, and they want to know what's what's the thing that's going to give them a migraine as they go down the journey what, what was your greatest challenge it's tough to pick one um, there's definitely a couple that I can think of at the top but I will respect the rules and I'll, I'll dive into a different uh, direction and I would say internal changeover so we're we're a mega agency so have both the environmental side and the and the conservation and recreation side so um you know very political driven agency um, a lot of changeover in directors um all the way down to your division administrators and even um bureau chiefs um have been uh, quick to change over since we've started r3 um i know me personally i think our team has had um, uh, what, eight bosses in the past like five, six years. So it's, it's definitely a challenge because you're, you're always having to go back and re-educate and bring those folks up to speed um, on, on what you've been doing, what the, what the problems are, what the concepts are, um, your partnerships, you know, you're constantly, you know, reselling what you're doing and, and re um, affirming that you have the support um, that you need to do. But um, there is positive too, because um, you know if you happen to have folks that may not be interested in in R three or interested in the conservation or recreation side, then it gives you new opportunity when you do have new management comes in. And I, I would say this past year, year and a half, we probably have the strongest and most supportive leadership that we've had in regards to R3. Um, we have a much younger management team at the top level. Um, we have females in roles at the top level. So it's been a pretty exciting time as we've seen, you know, even up to our director level, her jumping in with her two feet, um, getting engaged in R3 and she's been the most supportive um, that we've ever had at, at that top level. So it brings some some benefits too, but it, it's definitely a challenge and, and definitely a lot of work to continually re-educate and get folks up to speed on where you've been and where you are and where you're going. That's a solid answer. I mean, just the average turnover rate for a director in, across the country is about two to three years. That's just nuts. I mean, you've got to have some continuity there. Um, Ryan, what, what, what keeps you up at night? What's, what's been the, uh, the, the biggest challenge? You're kind of new to the Arizona program and, and you've been juggling a lot. What's, what would you say is the toughest? Yeah, I, I think that, you know, specifically in Arizona where we do work with so many different diverse stakeholders and things like that, it's so important that the, as the agency, we remain in a coordination role. 
um, really is in, instead of a leadership role. And it was mentioned, I think Jen and Megan both mentioned it, but um, it's, it's a mutually beneficial relationship, partnership. Um, this isn't all for the agencies taking right in understanding that you're working with different levels of sophistication of partnerships. We, you know, we work with national level NGOs and we work with local rod and gun clubs. So providing them the opportunities and resources to be successful and understanding that they are different, um, but, but making sure they have what they need. And, and again, it's, it's, it's for their behalf and for their benefit and for them to be the most effective they can be and not just for us to, to use them to kind of deliver our, our free mission. So I think staying in coordination in a yeah. coordination role, you know, kind of air traffic control role for us is, is key. And it's challenging at times because we want to be in control, but. Um, no, I, you know, that's, that's a great point. You know, having a little bit of situational leadership, it's not one size fits all, right? All right. Jack, Jen, what's uh, in California, what's, what's the toughest struggle? Um, again, it's hard to, to pick one. Um, you know, I agree with what everyone else has said. Um, that's also a challenge here, but really probably the greatest challenge, and it actually happens to be my favorite sort of topic too, is sort of the stronghold or stagnation of the mindsets that appear as dogmas within the hunting and fishing community, um, slash making space for diverse voices and interests while also maintaining that like mutual, mutually beneficial outcome, right? So, uh, especially in the beginning of this process of working with external partners, it often requires sort of this, like an assertive push to get people to leave their personal agendas and biases at the door in order to be able to work together. Um, and I just want to put it out there that when, when one does that and sort of brings skin to the game to say, hey, look, we're trying to create an inclusive space, not an exclusive space, because you think certain people should or shouldn't be here. Um, people are going to leave. People are going to drop out. And I, I think that's okay. Um, while we want everyone to show up, not all people or organizations are, are there yet, right? They're not all uh, able to show up in that way. Um, that being said, I think that um, a lot of these people and organizations will be reengaged farther down the pipeline because what we've been left with in California in, in doing that and making that space available is this really strong group of core influencers that have started to shift sort of the social landscape of R3 work. Um, whereas before that landscape maybe felt like only one or two people felt that these changes need to be made and didn't feel like there was a place for them to speak up about it because they may be kicked out or ostracized when it turns out that more people than not feel that way right and so we've been able to shift that dynamic a little bit uh, and there's still work to do around that but as a result we've been able to have all these great conversations of inclusive and diversity um, sort of bloom out of this and like we thought in the beginning the people that did drop out all of a sudden are starting to come back so I think that that pressure coming like full circle uh, has created a place where we can start talking about how do we change that stronghold or the stagnation of mindsets um, and address diverse voices and interests in hunting, fishing, and the shooting sports. And I think that kind of goes back to Charles's comments about the newness of R3, right? There's still a lot of people who don't understand that we need R3, that this is important. Um, and you and I have had a lot of conversations on, on the diversity piece. So you're obviously a champion on that. Uh, I would encourage, uh, you know, Jen and I have had a lot of conversations. She's got a lot of good insights on this. I would use her as a resource. Um, all right, uh, last question uh, really quick. Uh, Megan, I'd like to start with you. Uh, what, is, what is it about your structure or your model uh, that, that you're most proud of that makes, that makes your, your plan a success? I would say, um, the adaptability of it. Um, that's one of the biggest things that um, we've discovered over our journey the last five or six years of, of building this collaborative stru structure is you, you have to be adaptable. I mean, you even mentioned yourself, there's there's no one size fit, fits all model. Um, what may work this year may not work next year. And and you definitely have to be willing to, to adapt and, and move as needs change and, and as uh, players come and go within your collaboration. Um, one of the biggest things I could kind of leave folks with is um, 
you're not going to get that perfect model right off the bat and it may never be perfect. Um, you definitely, you can't spin your wheels and, and waste all your energy trying to bring every partner that you can possibly think on at once. Um, you're going to have to go with the folks that are, are willing to jump in with you and, and start collaborating and, and working towards good things. And, and those other folks will eventually come along when they're ready and um, successes will definitely, um, sell themselves and, and what we've definitely quickly seen, especially um, with COVID, which definitely opened up the doors um, for us to kind of work with partners in, in a different way and even a more expanded way with doing some of these virtual things that a lot of states have been trying. It's allowed us to get more partners engaged because they're able to do stuff from the comfort of their homes and, and stuff like that. And when we started putting out press releases and and talking about doing learn to hunts with this organization or with that organization, then some of the folks that have kind of been sitting and, and not really being engaged or all of a sudden the phone's ringing and they want to know how they can jump on board because they're, they're seeing these organizations get the credit. They're seeing these organizations get the benefits of still being able to reach um, audiences and constituents in a time when it's been a little bit more difficult to do so. So um, definitely being adaptable and, and, you know, just you got to let success sell itself and, and let folks come on when they're ready. You know, that is such a good point. You know, in collaboration, it's not like a business. You don't get to pick your team, right? You got to work with who comes to the table. That's, that's a great point. Um, Ryan, working in Arizona, what, what's the thing that, that uh, you know, lets you sleep at night when the other things are stressing you out? Yeah, I think kind of a, actually a good, good follow-up to Megan is that, you know, what, what's worked for us really well in Arizona is that we operate under... We operate under a title that we that we labeled the Outdoor Skills Network, which has really been our uniform customer experience business model. But we operate under that while still allowing um, our partners and stakeholders to stay true to their identities, to be who they are. Um, a lot of efforts from conservation organizations, partners, things like that have been going on much longer than R3 has been going on, right? And that we've really been doing that in our in our state. So allowing them to stay true to their identity, true to their focus, but using, you know, sound R3 science, the national action plan, things where we are kind of starting to, to turn the boat in, in the same direction um, in, in being able to keep that a delicate balance, right? You know, I think um, one thing you, you say a lot, Scott, which really resonates with me, right, is that nobody's making money on this, nobody's getting rich on, off of this. R3 is for the betterment of conservation, the entire state, the entire country, and really all of us. And, and making sure that that message remains loud and clear. And I think that kind of ties back to my challenge of the state agency remaining in the collaboration role and not in, the, in a leadership role. Um, and just really making sure that R3 and, and is on the, the forefront of everybody's efforts and, and not nice. uh, anything else, so. That sounds pretty cool. Uh, Jennifer, what, what's, the, what's the thing that, that just most proud of that that's working great in California? I think it's probably the fact that uh, we practice uh, the idea of there's no experts in the room, only practitioners, and practitioners practice to get better. Um, and so, you know, much like everyone else has said, like our role is really to facilitate, not not necessarily to know. Um, and and it's inclusive of of not only all levels of staff within the department, but also inclusive of all lo levels of partners. Um, and so with that, we become better practitioners because we're able to practice on a wider variety of landscapes. I, I, that's awesome. You know, we're all human. We're going to make mistakes and you got to be able to forgive those mistakes and, and keep people welcome and participating. That, that's some really great feedback. Dollars, you get to close out the lightning round here uh, in Georgia with Georgia's successes and hopefully we can get some up. Uh, uh, community questions in here. Awesome. Yeah, I think um, I'm probably going to circle back to what the greatest challenge was as, as well, because that's one of the biggest successes is having that hybrid position that's hosted outside of the agency, you know, especially with it being a, a lower to mid level position, it allowed it a lot of flexibility being out of the agency It allowed direct lines to the top of every organization. And it allowed that, that kind of adaptability that, that Megan talked about. You know, we're all kind of resistant to change, but change is the only real constant. So it's something that we tried to harp on with the Georgia R3 initiative. Uh, Mike Worley, who's the CEO of Georgia Wildlife Federation, always wanted to focus on our, our ability to experiment. And that was a big highlight. So 
being able to try out new things and, and know that some of them are going to fail is key. Um, and having leadership that's supportive of that was, was always nice in Georgia and will continue to be so as they move forward. Which, by the way, one plug, the uh, Georgia R3 coordinator position is open for applications. So if you have any questions, let me know. That's awesome. But, you know, that's my boss says it all the time. Survival is not uh, guaranteed changes. And, and you're absolutely right. You guys all talked about adaptability. Guys, thank you for, for sharing your, your intellectual insights. Um, Kristen, I'm not sure if we have time to open it up to the audience. Uh, what's our tolerance? Uh, we've got about five minutes. If you guys want to leave off with like a 30 second rundown of what's what's the future look like for your programs. Okay, we'll we'll go back up to the top of the batting or order. Uh, Ryan, what's next, real quick? Yeah, I think I think a lot of our focus right now, obviously, in in the wild year we're in uh, regarding COVID, is we're we're focused on a lot of online resources, things that that are going to operate a little more timelessly, um, which we can still tie back to different event implementation and on the ground efforts, but things that maybe will operate in the digital space that that can be um, a little more timeless and reusable. That's probably our number one focus right now. Nice. I like that. Uh, Jennifer, what's, what, where are you guys headed in California? I, I feel like it's the same, same answer. <laughs> um, beyond that, um, I think also we're really focused on um, creating more collaborative spaces because I don't know about other states, but California's giant, right? We have a geography problem here because the state is so huge that getting everyone together in the same space requires a lot of money, it requires a lot of time. Um, and now that we're on this, you know, virtual life, it actually helps California with our efforts because it's at our fingertips now to collaborate. So I'm looking forward in 2021 to really move towards a, a heavier collaborative model, both inside the department and outside the department to make sure that we're meeting our implementation goals. That's an exciting journey. Charles, uh, I, I don't know if you know what's next. You're not there anymore. What's, <laughs> what's next is... You know, they're going to hire a, a new, excited, energetic R3 coordinator to get the ground running. And uh, I look forward to sitting down with that person and seeing what they do with the future. I think it's there's a lot of opportunity there. So I'm looking forward to seeing what Georgia does next. Nice. There's some big hunting boots to fill for sure. Megan, what do you, what's, what's on your calendar? What, where are you headed? What's, what's the next big thing? Definitely, um, the virtual world has opened up the door for us. So, I mean, I know we've all participated on virtual meetings prior to, to COVID coming into place, but um, I think more of us got access to those tools to use them more regularly. So we've definitely had a lot of success. We've held 20 plus virtual learn to hunt, learn to trap type uh, workshops uh, this past fall. Um, it's been exciting seeing how scalable those events are. So when we've been doing our in-person ones, you know, may be able to get 15 or 20 from a particular area but we're, we're drawing people in from all over the state and even out of state so that's been really cool um, to see the the amount of participation in those and we also were able to take our summit virtual this year since we couldn't meet in person and um, we had a lot of a great feedback from our um, partners out there um, and I think the the virtual format is definitely going to be into play going forward and it's going to give us the ability to, to meet more frequently and a little more digestible bites um, of information sharing. So we've had a lot of requests to do some special trainings and do some special check-ins throughout the year. So I think it's going to actually increase our communication and with, um, with the majority versus just meeting with our smaller task force groups more frequently. I think we're going to get the bigger groups together more. That's really exciting. You know, disruptors create uh, evolution and, and change and, and COVID has been a disruptor, right? I think, uh, it's forced us to do things we didn't want to or thought, thought we would do. And, and now, wow, this is kind of cool. We can, we can reach more people in, in a virtual world. So definitely a good feedback. Um, I, again, I want to thank everybody for attending today. I want to thank the council for the opportunity to, uh, to put this project together and see it through. Uh, we hope that the, the, the resource for, for collaborative uh, partnerships is, is, is valuable to you. Um, I'm sure everyone on the panel here will be willing to ask, uh, you know, uh, you know, handle any questions. If you're, if you're beginning your journey on this, it, is, it can be a little thankless at the beginning, but it's absolutely worth the, the journey. So uh, we, we hope you see value in this and uh, 
thanks everybody for attending. I'll turn it over to, to Kristen to close this out. Awesome, thanks everyone. Thanks for your time, we really appreciate it. Scott, thanks for leading this group in the right direction and thanks to the group for following Scott and I and uh, being able to create a great product that hopefully people will use. Um, so with that, I will say good evening, good afternoon, whatever time it is in your time zone and uh, may the odds be ever in your favor. Thanks guys. Have a great day.